You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services. Your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the Internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group, and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, and welcome to the heart of fiat, crucified love. This week, I think this is episode 82, (laughs) I have to go look, but we are deep into the heart of crucified love, right? Of saying fiat to the Lord and learning how to love him um, all the way through crucifixion and death, right? The things that we touch on um, are very deep and very intimate. They're deeper than most podcasts probably go. They're very meaty, but that was my hope was to share with you these, um, these riches, these treasures of the church. And this week we're gonna talk about art. We're gonna talk about Christian art. And so I'm sitting a little bit further back. I hope this works with the microphone. Um, But I wanted you to be able to see the door behind me and these icons. And then I brought out two of the statues that I've painted, St. Isidore and St. Therese of Lisieux. And um, these are all just different examples of, you know, me as an artist. But... You know, the gift of art goes way deeper than just kind of what you see. The purpose of Christian art is to draw the soul into um, heaven. You know, icons are called sometimes, you know, windows into heaven. And so the purpose of an artist in a Christian realm is to become almost transparent, to become just an instrument of the Holy Spirit to touch the human heart and to draw it to realities that are greater than, um, you know, what's really before one's eyes. And the church has such beautiful teachings on art. And I just went back to the catechism and um, pulled up a few of those teachings and then to John Paul II and his letter to artists. And um, I thought I would share with you from that because, you know, the teachings of the church is the, that foundation, those, those, sometimes they're boring, the bricks, right, that make up what we do. So, you know, I as an artist, I pull everything from just that. But then God comes and he decorates it. <laughs> and, you know, he makes it um, unique specifically to Mary Klaska and to the souls that he knows he's going to draw to look at what I've painted. Um, and to the message that he wants me to speak to the world through the art that I've um, created with him, right, for him, in him. So that is what we're going to talk about this week. And um, I chose for the song, I believe it was Rich Mullins, but it's a song that talks about um, how there's beauty in nature and how there's beauty in music and even in human relationships, a mother and a child or the friendship And those things are wonderful and incredible and awe-inspiring even sometimes. But God is greater than that, right? And what is most important is just that knowledge that we are children of God who belong in heaven. And 
That's what art is supposed to do. It's not supposed to be the end. It's supposed to open up a longing in us for something greater than even itself, which is for God, right? And, um, and that's what the song talks about. So we're going to sing this. And like I said, I hope the sound ends up okay. Um, and then I'll share with you from what I pulled together. And that will be that. And in the meantime, you can kind of look at some of the different images that I've, I have around me. You know, this door was very specific. I wrote, I, I painted it before I had completed um, the final editing of The Holiness of Womanhood. But in hindsight, I discovered that the door matches the book because it's about Jesus with women, right? You've got Mary and Martha here. Mary, you know, has chosen the better part. You've got the woman at the well, right? Give me a drink. On the top, you have Our Lady at Cana and him saying, do whatever she tells you. Here you have the woman, Mary, weeping at his feet and washing and anointing them and him defending her, saying, leave her alone. She's done a good thing for me. And we have the foot of the cross, woman, behold your son. And even underneath that, you can't see it. It's the resurrection story with Mary Magdalene. You know, Mary, woman, why are you weeping? And above me is the picture of desert Mary. And um, it's the cover of that book, Mornings with Mary, the rosary prayer book that um, I just published. And this is an interesting icon here above. It's one of the bigger, first bigger pieces I did. I did it for my bedroom and it was supposed to be kind of like a symbol of my heart. And it was the mystery of the Annunciation of Fiat, of the visitation. My name is Mary Elizabeth, right? And so that's the next one. The agony in the garden, because I'm so close to Jesus and his interior suffering. And then the crucifixion and death of our Lord. And then behind me, I have Our Lady of the Vine and her union with Jesus on the cross. And then, like I said, St. Isidore and St. Therese. So hopefully you can look at that as we pray, as we sing, as I speak, and it will inspire you in some artistic way yourself. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. for her 
Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I always change that. You know, it's always if I weep, let it be as a man longing for his home. But I always changed it to child longing for her home because that's what I am, right? The smallest of our Lord's children. <laughs> so, artists, I am calling you to reflect on your work a little bit. So often as an artist, you just work. Right? You just kind of do what you do. And you don't stop and think about um, you know, the, the reason behind it, let alone the theology behind it. Right? There are academic artists, people who study it and then do it that way. I'm not one at all. And I remember if you ever watched that interview with Timothy Schmaltz, um, that he's a, like a Vatican sculptor. He's an excellent, incredible artist. But he and I spoke about that, and I don't have time or room for academia in my art. And he agreed with me. But there's something different about theology, because theology is a study of God. And theology is something that we live in every part of our being. And it, um, it you know, points us to the reason of our life at all times, right? So, you know, to kind of theologize about your motherhood is helpful because it helps you to live it more virtuously and it helps you to, um, to have it not just be something that you're doing in life, you're a mother, but something that is helping in your path of holiness to get to heaven. And the same thing would be true with being an artist, right? It's very helpful to reflect on the theology of art and what God um, intended in allowing us to be artists with him. You know, God is the first artist. And if you look back at Genesis, um, that, that first story of creation, I mean, the second one as well, but it's God as the artist, right? He takes nothing and he makes something. Now, we take something and make it beautiful, right? We can't create from nothingness like God. 
But God is just an incredible artist if you look at sunrises or sunsets, if you study um, flower petals, if you study the, the wings of an insect or the pattern of a bird's feathers, if you study, you know, even animals, a zebra is so incredible. When you get close and you look at like the colors and the, and the patterns that God puts on a zebra or on a cheetah, right? The sky at night with stars. Today is a cloudy day. The way that God arranges the clouds, that he arranges the sun coming in. It's all part of his artistry. And the masterpiece of his art is humanity. It's every human person. Every human person is a masterpiece of God. From what they look like, their shape, their color of their eyes or their hair or their skin, the shape of their face. You know, if they're tall, if they're short, if they're, you know, small boned or big boned. And then their personality, you can have two identical twins who have completely different interests because God has made them uniquely. One might be very athletic and the other is, you know, more in their head and they, they're an artist or they like to um, read and to study and be a scientist. You might have one that is, you know, even different virtues, one is a very patient soul with difficulties or with, you know, screaming children or things. And others, you know, are a little bit more short-tempered. But even that, which would seem like a vice, is a gift in another situation, right? And the world needs all sorts of people. And, you know, like every snowflake and every flower is different. Every human being is different. And it's because God is the artist. So he created us in love. And then when we fell in sin, it was kind of like taking black paint and throwing it on the canvas of art. And it just destroys the image of God in us. And so Jesus comes with his blood to recreate us through the cross, through his suffering, through his wounds. You know, when you restore paintings, you have to sometimes put like a film on them, really old antique paintings. And it almost looks like it ruins it, like you can't see it. And then you take another material and you either peel it off or you pull it off, you know. And underneath the colors are vibrant again. Jesus washes us pure and white and clean into the image of God through his blood. His blood and his wounds, his love, is the paint that the Father uses to restore us, right? We're already created, but sin distorts his image, and he's always recreating us to be more and more a reflection of his love, which makes us, in essence, more and more ourselves. And then he allows us to have that gift to be an artist with him, right? John Paul II talks about that. I'll read a few quotes. But it's incredible that like in the Garden of Eden, like he could have like made the animals and named them and like taken care of everything, but no. He wanted Adam to partake in that work with him. So he let him create names. It says that he was allowed to name the animals. There's so much beauty that has been shared with us just in that essence that God is an artist and he's created us to be free, to be creative, so that we can create beauty with him, right? It's, I mean, you see it in like the marital act and the creation of a child, but you see it here on this door behind me, right? It was a very ugly door when I first got it. And God helped me to see beauty in it and to bring forth an image that would reflect his love very concretely in this world. So it's beautiful. But what does the catechism say about art and artists? There's a whole section on art. Um, it's paragraphs 2500 to 2503, if you're interested in looking them up later. But I'm just going to share with you because it's so beautiful. I can't even, um, sen you know, make a synopsis that would touch the beauty of what the church has given us. And they, um, they quote an awful lot from the book of wisdom that talks about being like an artisan with God. 
It says the practice of goodness is accompanied by spontaneous spiritual joy and moral beauty. So we're called to practice goodness, right? To be kind to people. But it's connected in having a spiritual joy and moral beauty. Moral beauty. That's so awesome. Likewise, truth carries with it the joy and splendor of spiritual beauty. So have you ever had, like, had somebody explain something so profoundly and you're like, whoa, that is beautiful. Well, it was just truth. But truth, beauty, and love are all related to each other. Truth is beautiful in itself. Truth in words, the rational expression of the knowledge of created and uncreated reality, is necessary to man who is endowed with an intellect. We need truth. But truth can also find other complementary forms of human expression. So not just in speaking it, right? Above all, when it's a matter of evoking what is beyond words, which is the depths of the human heart, the exaltations of the soul, and the mysteries of God. And the Catechism goes on to explain how truth can be spoken, but it can also be portrayed through art. It can also be taught through song, through poetry. They have beautiful things on poetry. But even before revealing himself to man in words of truth, God reveals himself to him through the universal language of creation, the work of his word and of his wisdom. The order and harmony of the cosmos, which both the child and the scientist discover. And the Book of Wisdom says, From the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. For the author of beauty created them. You know, the imprint of the artist is always in their work. That's why you can look at something and say, well, that's Picasso or that's Monet, right? People say, well, Mary, your art is so specific to you. You know, I can immediately tell if something was yours. Well, of course, because it's something of me in the icons, right? They're not the traditional icons that you'd see usually in Byzantine um, churches, because there is something that the Holy Spirit has taught me to put of myself. And um, it shows part of my own simplicity. Um, my organization, if you look, they're very detailed, you know, down to the, they're very, they're very sharp edges usually in things. Um, and even though they're very simple, there's depths and layers and layers and layers of meaning. And that's what, you know, different people who've studied my art have told me over and over. You look at it and you think, wow, that's really simple and almost childlike. And yet the meaning is so profound in it that you can meditate on it. Well, that's a perception. That's like a reflection of me as a person. I am a very simple person, a very childlike person. And yet I'm a very complex and deep spiritually person, right? And so that's portrayed in my art. Well, all the more God himself is portrayed in his art. So when we study the universe and the things that came directly from God, we see a reflection of who God is in that. It's so beautiful. And the book of wisdom says, Wisdom is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, an image of his goodness. And then further on, for wisdom is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior. For it is succeeded by the night, but against wisdom, evil never prevails. And I became enamored of her beauty. Now, what is so powerful in this section of catechism is they are really connecting the idea of truth and beauty, right? Which would make me think that if something is not truthful, if it's a lie, if it's against um, truth, 
then we wouldn't probably find it beautiful, right? And I was talking to a founder of a university once. I did an interview with him, and he taught a course on, like, the mathematics, the beauty of math or the mathematics of beauty or something. And it was just fascinating to me because math is true. Like, 2 plus 2 is 4. But there is something that's very mathematical about art that is beautiful and pleasing to the eye. Now, I do not paint according to math. I don't measure and think it all out linearly like the way that maybe a computer program would. But there's something natural in me that knows when something's proportionate or not or needs to be moved. That's kind of like an innate way of relating math to beauty, right? But math is truth. And so that, you know, if you say that, oh, that perspective or that, um, you know, the way that this relates to each other, you know, it fits or it looks good. That usually means that it's a good reflection of what reality would be. So anyway, I, I mean, you can see in all of that um, how truth and beauty are very connected. And I think that's too why when Jesus Christ came to earth, he was the great, you know, um, the masterpiece of the father. He came incarnate to reveal the face of the artist of the father to us, right? And he left his image among us so that we could contemplate heaven in him, in his face and in his heart, right? And our lady too, you know, she was the masterpiece of woman. She's the masterpiece of humanity. And, um, because of that, she could pray, my soul magnifies, proclaims the greatness of the Lord. She is beautiful because she's proportionate and she keeps herself small and God big, even in what she shows to people, right? So paragraph 2501, created in the image of God, man also expresses the truth of his relationship with God, the creator, by the beauty of his artistic works. Indeed, art is a distinctively human form of expression beyond the search for the necessities of life, which is common to all living creatures. Art is a freely given superabundance of the human being's inner riches. It's a superabundance. So it's not, art is not something that like you can die without, right? You need food, shelter, and clothing. Instead, it's, you know, that extra decoration, that extra beauty. It's, it's a superabundance of what the Lord has placed within us to share with each other and um, really to draw our hearts closer to him and to fill us with joy. You can't look at something really beautiful and not experience joy. It's, it's together. Arising from talent given by the creator and from man's own effort, art is a form of practical wisdom, uniting knowledge and skill to give form to the truth of reality in a language accessible to sight or hearing. To the extent that it's inspired by truth and love of beings, Art bears a certain likeness to God's activity in what he has created. Like any other human activity, art is not an absolute end in itself, but it's ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. That's what I was saying is that you're never an artist just to make people absorbed in that canvas itself. If you're an artist, a Christian artist, an iconographer especially, you create beauty and art so that people who encounter it are drawn into the heart of God. Paragraph 2502, sacred art is true and beautiful when its form corresponds to its particular vocation, which is invoking and glorifying in faith and adoration the transcendent mystery of God, the, insurpass the surpassing invisible beauty of truth and love that is visible in Christ, who reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, in whom the whole fullness of di deity dwells bodily. So creating art should be 
an act of faith and adoration and of glorifying God in and of itself, the action of painting. Say I paint something beautiful and nobody encounters it. It still glorifies God. The act of creating beauty. I think of the concentration camp where St. Maximilian Kolbe died there in Auschwitz. And when you're looking at the cell where he died, on the right-hand side down the hall at the very end is another dark cell. And there um, against the wall, there's an image, a beautiful image of Jesus crucified that was carved into the wall by another prisoner who was dying. What if nobody ever discovered that crucifix etched into the wall of that prison cell of an Auschwitz? Even if nobody's ever seen it, which many millions of people have seen this image now, it still glorified God. The artist was reflecting what was in his heart as he was dying, which was Jesus crucified. And just in creating beauty, God was being glorified. The spiritual beauty of God is reflected in the most holy virgin mother of God, the angels and the saints. Genuine sacred art draws man into adoration, into prayer, to the love of God, creator and savior, the holy one and sanctifier. Paragraph 2503, and this is from the document of the church, Sacrosanctum Concilium. For this reason, bishops, personally or through delegates, should see to the promotion of sacred art, both old and new, in all of its forms, and with the same religious care, remove from the liturgy and from places of worship everything which is not in conformity with the truth of faith and the authentic beauty of sacred heart, art. It's a bishop's responsibility to make sure their churches are beautiful. And then later on in 2513, it just summarizes this again from Sacrosanctum Concilium. The fine arts, but above all sacred art of their nature are directed toward expressing in some way the infinite beauty of God in works made by human hands. Their dedication to the increase of God's praise and of his glory is more complete the more exclusively they are devoted to turning men's minds devoutly toward God. So the whole purpose of creating this sacred art is so that when people look at it, they think of God. And then in the catechism, it also touches on sacred art in the section on icons. And it says in 1159, the sacred image, the liturgical icon, principally represents Christ. It cannot represent the invisible and incomprehensible God, but only the incarnation of the Son of God, which is ushered in a new economy of images. Previously, this is from St. John Damascene. Previously, God, who has neither a body nor a face, absolutely could not be represented by an image. And that's why it's said in the Old Testament, don't make an image of a God, you know, in a piece of wood or a piece of clay. But now he's made himself visible in the flesh. He lived among men. And because of that, I can make an image of the God who I have seen. In Jesus Christ. I can contemplate the glory of the Lord, his face unveiled, because he came to earth unveiled, right? And you know, so often people have, um, there have been times in the church where people, the iconoclasts, that get angry about making images of God. But my first answer to that would be Saint Veronica on the way of the cross. Jesus himself is the first one who leaves an image of himself to be honored and revered. When St. Veronica wiped his face with the veil, he left his image on that veil. When they wrapped his body after death in the cloth, right, the Shroud of Turin, when it was opened up and it's displayed for people, you can see the image of Jesus physically. 
And think of all the different people, even starting in the Gospels where Jesus was appearing in the resurrection and stuff. He was showing his image, his face, to those who loved him, who sought after him. When St. Paul was traveling and got knocked off his horse, he saw an image of Christ who said, why are you persecuting? Images mark themselves deep within our minds and our, our blood, our, our, our body. There's a scientist up in Canada who studies blood, and he would take blood from a crime scene, and if you blow it up really big, you could see images of what was happening during that crime, so he could identify the, the killer sometimes. Because blood goes behind your eyes, and what you see is imprinted on your blood for a period of time. Well, when I heard about this, I was just blown away because I thought, wow, no wonder like sins that when you look at something impure, it affects you so terribly. You know, you look at pornography that's imprinted on you. But then again, when you gaze at a beautiful piece of art, you gaze at Jesus in the Eucharist, that's imprinted upon you, within you. And when you receive his blood, it purifies you. And it's his blood that helps you to see like him because it goes behind your eyes, right? It's purifying. It's so beautiful to see the way how images can imprint themselves upon you. Paragraph 1160 says, Christian iconography expresses in images the same gospel message that scripture communicates by words. The words and the images illuminate each other. We declare that we preserve intact, this is from the Council of Nicaea, all the written and unwritten traditions of the church, which have been entrusted to us. One of these traditions consists in the production of representational artwork, which accords with the history of the preaching of the gospel. For it confirms that the incarnation of the word of God was real and not imaginary and to our benefit as well, for realities that illustrate each other undoubtedly reflect each other's meaning. So it's interesting how the gospel is to be passed on not only in word, but in images. And it continues in 1161, all the signs in the liturgical celebrations are related to Christ as are sacred images of the Holy Mother of God and the saints as well. They truly signify Christ who is glorified in them. They make manifest the cloud of witnesses who continue to participate in the salvation of the world and to whom we are united, above all in sacramental celebrations. Through their icons, it is man in the image of God, finally transfigured into his likeness, who is revealed to our faith. And so too are the angels who are also recapitulated in Christ. So when we look at these holy images, say it's, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, what draws us to him and makes our heart drawn to God by looking at him is Jesus glorified in him. Following the divinely inspired teaching of our holy fathers and the tradition of the Catholic Church, for we know that this tradition comes from the Holy Spirit who dwells in her, we rightly define with full certainty and correctness that like the figure of the precious and life-giving cross, venerable and holy images of our Lord and God, Savior Jesus Christ, our inviolate lady, the Holy Mother of God, the venerated angels, all of the saints and the just, whether they're painted or they're made of a mosaic or another suitable material, are to be exhibited in the holy churches of God, on sacred vessels and vestments, walls and panels, in houses and on the street. I think the Council of Nicaea would love my house. <laughs> my apartment is everywhere, just pointing to heaven, right? 1162 says, The beauty of the images moves me to contemplation as a meadow delights the eyes and steadily infuses the soul with the glory of God. 
Similarly, the contemplation of sacred icons, united with meditation on the word of God and the singing of liturgical hymns, entered into the harmony of the signs of celebration so that the mystery celebrated is imprinted in the heart's memory and is then expressed in the new life of the faithful. So music, images, and the word of God should all be used together to glorify God and to help imprint that message of the gospel on our hearts. 2705 also says, Meditation is above all a quest. The mind seeks to understand the why and how of the Christian life in order to adhere and respond to what the Lord is asking. The required attentiveness is difficult to sustain. We are usually helped by books and Christians do not want for them. The sacred scriptures, particularly the gospels, the holy icons, the liturgical check texts of the day or the season, the writings of the spiritual fathers, works of spirituality, the great book of creation, and that of history on the page of which the today of God is written. So icons are to be used as meditation. And it's true, you can just put like a candle in front of an icon and stare at it and pray. And it is a window into heaven. It draws down, you know, special graces upon you. You might look and say, wow, you know, in this crucifix, Jesus is so patient, so patient. And as you're meditating on his patience and his passion, you are being infused with that virtue. Sacred images, sacred art is so important for that. 1192 says sacred images in our churches and in our homes are intended to awaken and nourish our faith in the mystery of Christ. Through the icon of Christ and his works of salvation, it is he whom we adore. Through sacred images of the Holy Mother of God, of the angels and saints, we venerate the persons represented. And lastly, paragraph 2131 says, basing itself on the mystery of the incarnate word, the Seventh Ecumenical Council at Nicaea justified against the iconoclasts the veneration of icons of Christ, but also of the Mother of God, the angels and saints. By becoming incarnate, the Son of God introduced a new economy of images. By Jesus becoming incarnate as the image of the unseen God, he gave a new, he almost sanctified um, images and what we see. He gave a new meaning to visible beauty. He gave a new meaning to the vocation of an artist, really. And in 1999, Pope John Paul II wrote a beautiful letter to artists. I can't read the whole thing because it's quite long. But I'm going to read some quotes from it because it's very inspirational. And he said he wrote it to all who are passionately de dedicated to the search for new epiphanies of beauty so that through their creative work as artists, they may offer these gifts to the world. For God saw all that he had made and it was very good. He quoted Genesis. The opening page of the Bible where this is written presents God as a kind of exemplar of everyone who produces a work, said St. John Paul II. The human craftsman mirrors the image of God as a creator. We already talked about that. This relationship is particularly clear in the Polish language because of the lexical link between the word creator and craftsman. The word for creator in Polish is is for Stforza, sorry, Stforza. And the name for a craftsman, somebody who creates, is Tforza. So it's very similar. It's almost the same word. What is the difference between a creator and a craftsman, the Pope asks. The one who creates bestow, bestows being itself. So he brings something out of nothing. There was nothing and then God created the world, right? In the strict sense, 
the mode of operation belongs only to the Almighty alone to be a creator, right? Because only he can bring something out of nothing. But the craftsman, which we are all called to be in one way or another, right? A, um, a plumber is a craftsman because he has to be creative in the way that he fixes pipes and he connects things up so that water can flow, right? I am also a craftsman, right? Or craftswoman in the way that I create images on wood, right? Beautiful art. And, you know, a father is also a craftsman because he has to come up with very um, creative ways to teach his children through stories, the morals that they need to learn in life, right? We're all called to be craftsmen. And craftsmen, by contrast, use something that already exists to which he gives form and meaning. I take paint that exists I take wood that exists and I make it into something beautiful. My dad, he's a, he's a, um, a carpenter and like a carver. He's a, you know, so he'll take wood, but then he'll use a knife to create something very beautiful for God. This is the mode of operation peculiar to man as made in the image of God. In fact, after saying that God created man and woman in his image, the Bible adds that he entrusted them the task of the, having dominion over all the earth, right? God therefore called man into existence, committing to him the craftsman task. Through his artistic creativity, man appears more than ever in the image of God, and he accomplishes this task above all in shaping the wondrous material of his own humanity. And then exercising creative dominion over the universe which surrounds him. So it's so beautiful. He says the first work of an artist is not to create something material. But what he's artistically doing with his own life, right? You're given your own humanity in this world. In a span of 10 years, 40 years, 90 years, we don't know. But at the end, we have to return to God, our humanity. And having been an artist, we have to make sure we've conformed our image as a man or a woman on earth to that of Jesus Christ, to glorifying God. Pope John Paul II says, With loving regard, the divine artist passes on to the human artist a spark of his own, surpassing wisdom, calling him to share in his own creative power. Creative art, which is which it is the soul's good fortune to entertain, is not to be identified with that essential art, which is God himself, but is only a communication and a share of it. That's what Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa said. So we are not even the end. We are only to share in that beauty of God the artist himself, right? John Paul II says that is why artists, the more conscious they of are of their gift, are led all the more to see themselves and the whole of creation with eyes able to contemplate and give thanks and to raise to God a hem of praise. This is the only way for them to come to a full understanding of themselves, their vocation, and their mission. Not all are called to be artists in the specific meaning of that term. Yet as Genesis has it, all men and women are entrusted with the task of crafting their own life. In a certain sense, they are to make of it a work of art and a masterpiece. So in that way, we are all called to be artists of our own lives. In producing a work, artists must express themselves to the point where their work becomes a unique disclosure of their own being, of what they are and of how they are what they are. And that's what I'm saying. So often you don't need to know, you know, who created an art piece. You can look at it and say, you know, that's Mary Klaska, right? It reflects who you are. There are endless examples of this in human history. In shaping a masterpiece, the artist not only summons his work into being, but in some way reveals his own personality 
by means of it. Through his work, the artist speaks to others and communicates to them. Works of art speak of their authors. They enable us to know their inner life and they reveal the original contribution which artists offer to the history of culture. And he notices that in perceiving all that he had created was good, God saw that it was beautiful as well. He saw the beauty, goodness. Greeks talked about kalokagathia. It's really hard to say, kalokagathia, which is beauty, goodness. It was one word. Plato said the power of the good has taken refuge in the nature of the beautiful. The power of the good has taken refuge in the nature of the beautiful. So it makes sense that God as an artist created all these things. And then he said, this is very good, right? This is very beautiful. What he created was beautiful and good. It's all together. That's why you can't have, um, you know, satanic art is not good, but it's also not beautiful. You can tell when something is evil, it's got this darkness, a disproportion. I, you know, it's not, if it's not good, it's not beautiful. A child will never be drawn to something that is evil because children are drawn to purity, to goodness, and to beauty. The Pope says, those who perceive in themselves a kind of divine spark, which is the artistic vocation, as a poet, a writer, a sculptor, an architect, a musician, an actor, and so on. They feel at the same time the obligation not to waste this talent, but to develop it in order to put it at the service of their neighbor and humanity as a whole. When I feel like the Lord is wanting me to create something, it's a fire in me. I don't care if nobody else in the world ever sees it. It's a fire in me to do because... God wants me to do it for the sake of it itself. Same thing when I'm writing a song, right? And that's what he's saying. A true artist has that inspiration. It's an obligation to use the gift within your heart to glorify God. Society needs artists, Pope John Paul II says. Just as it needs scientists, technicians, workers, professional people, witnesses of faith, teachers, fathers, mothers, who ensure the growth of the person and the development of the community by which of that supreme art form, which is the art of education. So the world needs artists, but he also needs art to be um, lived in all the vocations, right? He's saying a teacher is an artist. It's the art of education. In the mystery of the incarnation, the Son of God becomes visible as a per person. And so it's an epiphany of God who is a mystery that inspires artists to do what they do for his glory. From God being a mystery has come a flowering beauty which draw, has drawn its sap precisely from the mystery of the incarnation. In becoming man, the Son of God introduced into human history all the evangelical wealth of the true and the good. And with this, he has also unveiled a new dimension of beauty. So it's interesting when he listed all the different kinds of artists, there's those who do art as a painter, but there's those who are architects. That's a form of art. Actors. You know, John Paul II himself was an artist. He was a poet and he was an actor. How did, was he an artist in that? He had to artistically portray an image or something to other people, a message. And how much more directly is that a work of God when you're portraying a Bible story or something like that, right? There is a great alliance between God and art. There's a hidden mystery behind art, which is God. All artists experience the unbridgeable gap which lies between the work of their hands, however successful it may be, and the dazzling perfection of the beauty glimpsed in the ardor of the creative moment. 
What you see that is beautiful in the material is only a glimmer or a sign of the actual inspiration, which is something that is real in heaven in perfection, right? I can, I can draw baby Jesus, but as much as it might be beautiful and look like baby Jesus, it doesn't. He is that much better. So art, which is good and holy, is a springboard to draw you to that perfection, which is a hidden mystery, but perceptible by your heart at times. What an artist manages to express in his painting or his sculpting, his creating, is no more than a glimmer of the splendor which flared for a moment before the eyes of their spirit. And, you know, St. Francis um, of Assisi, when he received the stigmata, which was the truth and the image of Jesus on his body, he kept repeating, you are beauty, you are beauty. So there was something with that experience of the Jesus who is the truth, Jesus who is the life, who is goodness, imprinting himself on him that simultaneously imprinted beauty on the body and the heart of St. Francis of Assisi. St. Bonaventure says in things of beauty, he contemplated the one who is supremely beautiful, led by the footprints he found in creatures. He followed the beloved everywhere. He's speaking of St. Francis. Something that's corresponding to that in Eastern spirituality is where Christ is described as the supremely beautiful, possessed of a beauty above all the children of the earth. Macarius the Great speaks of the transfiguring and liberating beauty of the risen Lord, saying the soul which has been fully illuminated by the unspeakable beauty of the glory shining on the countenance of Christ overflows with the Holy Spirit. It is all eye, all light, all con con countenance. Every genuine art form in its own way is a path to the inmost reality of man and the world. And architecture, he talks about the importance of architecture, doing the same thing as an image, is drawing the attention of the people to God to glorifying God. He talks about different forms of painting and sculpture. He says that Augustine talks about this in his work De Musica, how music is supposed to do the same thing, be created artistically, but draw the attention of the people up to God. Hilary of Poitiers, Ambrose, Prudentius, Ephraim the Syrian, Gregory of Nazianzus, Paulus of Nola, are all some people who wrote artistic poetry to do the same thing, to draw people's attention to God, to just present a, a, a art form that's a window to heaven, right? And it's like their poetry was not only something that, um, literarily beautiful, but it was theological. It was the teaching of a truth. It was nourished by the pure sap of the gospel. St. Paulus of Nola said, Our only art is faith. Our only music is Christ. Gregory the Great compiled um, the beautiful music, right, that turned into Gregorian chant. That was an artist doing what the Pope is talking about. And with this beautiful music, the beautiful was wedded to the true, so that through art, souls might be lifted from the world to the senses that are eternal. And then he discusses that Council of Nicaea, which I already read from the Catechism, that defends icons against those who say that you shouldn't make an image of God, right? Right? He talks about icons as being almost a sacrament. And a sacrament is something that points you to God, right? So a visible reality of an invisible reality. 
That is why the beauty of the icon can be best appreciated in a church where in the shadows burning lamps stir infinite flickerings of light. Pavel Florensky said, by the flat day, by the flat light of day, gold is crude, heavy, and useless. But by the tremulous light of a lamp or candle, it springs to life and glitters and sparks beyond counting. Now here, now there, evoking the sense of the other lights, not of this earth, but lights that fill the space of heaven. I'm going to skip here towards the end. And he talks just more about the theology of all this. Here towards the end, he talks about the Second Vatican Council and what they had to say about art and artists. Gaudium et Spes stressed the great importance of literature and the arts in the human life. It said they seek to probe the true nature of man, his problems and experiences, as he strives to know and perfect himself in the world, to discover his place in history and the universe, to portray his miseries and joys, his needs and strengths with a view to a better future. And at the end, the council father said, this world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink and to despair. Isn't that beautiful? We need artists, we need beauty to not fall into despair. Beauty like truth brings joy to the human heart and is that precious fruit which resists the erosion of time, which unites generations and enables them to be one in admiration. Artists have a noble ministry when their works reflect in some way the infinite beauty of God and they raise people's minds to them. Artists need to have the knowledge of God so that he can be better revealed and that he can be preached through their work more profoundly. The church needs art, it says here at the end. In order to communicate the message entrusted to her by Christ, the church needs art. Art must make perceptible and as far as possible attractive the world of the spirit and the invisible God. Art has a unique capacity to take one or other facet of the message and translate it into colors, shapes, and sounds which nourish the intuition of those who look at it or listen to it. Christ himself made extensive use of images in his preaching, fully in keeping with his willingness to become in the incarnation, the icon of the unseen God. The church not only needs artists, the church needs musicians. The church needs architects. And so at the end, Pope John Paul II has an appeal to artists. It is with all of this in mind that I appeal to you, artists of the written and spoken word, of the theater and music, of the plastic arts and the most recent technologies in the field of communication. Podcasts, right? It's an artistic thing. I appeal especially to you Christian artists. I wish to remind each of you that beyond functional considerations, the close alliance that has always existed between the gospel and art means that you are invited to use your creative intuition to enter into the heart of the mystery of the incarnate God and at the same time into the mystery of man. Human beings in a certain sense are unknown to themselves. And Jesus Christ not only reveals God, but fully reveals man to man. In Christ, God has reconciled the world to himself. All believers are called to bear witness to this, but it's up to you, men and women who have given your lives to art, to declare with all the wealth of your ingenuity that in Christ, the world is redeemed. 
The human person is redeemed. The human body is redeemed. And the whole creation, which according to St. Paul, awaits impatiently the revelation of the children of God, is redeemed. That's your vocation. That's your obligation. If you've been given the gift of art. The creation awaits the revelation of the children of God, also through art and in art. This is your task. Humanity at every age, even today, looks to works of art to shed light upon its path and its destiny. Often in the church, there resounds the invocation of the Holy Spirit, Veni Creator Spiritus, Come, O Creator Spirit, visit our minds, fill with your grace the hearts that you have created. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. Ruah, right? What affinity between those words of breath and breathing and inspiration. Every artist has to be inspired to do something. Who's inspiring you? The breath of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the mysterious artist of the whole universe. Dear artists, you well know that there are many impulses which either from within or from without can inspire your talent. Every genuine inspiration, however, contains some tremor of that breath with which the Creator Spirit suffused the work of creation in the very beginning. Any inspiration you have comes from that original breath of God that created you. Overseeing the mysterious laws governing the universe, the divine breath of the creator's spirit reaches out to human genius and it stirs creative power. He touches it with a kind of inner illumination which brings together the sense of the good and the beautiful. And he awakens the energy of the mind and heart, which enable it to conceive an idea and give it form in a work of art. It is right then to speak, even if only analogically, of moments of grace, because the human being is able to experience in some way the absolute who is utterly beyond. And then he quotes Dostoevsky, the beauty that saves, beauty will save the world. Beauty is a key to the mystery and call to transcendence. It's an invitation to savor life and dream of the future. That is why the beauty of created things can never fully satisfy. It stirs that hidden nostalgia for God, which a lover of beauty like St. Augustine could express in incomparable terms. Late have I loved you, beauty so old and new. Late have I loved you, he wrote. Artists of the world, John Paul II is writing this, artists of the world, may your many different paths all lead to that infinite ocean of beauty, where wonder becomes awe, exhilaration, and unspeakable joy. May you be guided and inspired by the mystery of the risen Christ, whom the church in these days contemplates with joy. He wrote this in the Easter season. May the Blessed Virgin Mary be with you always. She is the tota pulcura, portrayed by countless artists, whom Dante contemplates among the splendors of paradise as the beauty that was joy in the eyes of all the other saints. From chaos there rises in the world the spirit. These words of Adam Mikiewicz, written at a time of great hardship for his Polish homeland, prompt my hope for you. So from the chaos, there rises the world of the spirit. When everything is chaotic in the physical world, the, the life of the spirit comes to life, right? And the Pope summarizes his words as this, may your art help to affirm that true beauty, which as a glimmer of the spirit of God 
will transfigure matter, opening the human soul to the sense of the eternal. From the Vatican, April 4th, 1999, Easter Sunday. So that's heavy and it's so beautiful. I hope and I pray that by sharing some of this theology and these meditations on art from the Catechism and from John Paul II, from the saints, from the councils, that it may inspire and give meaning to your art all the more, to all of the artists out there that are listening to this. And we pray, dear Jesus, that you open up your heart and that you pour out a torrent of your love on all of those called to the vocation of art in any way in the world. That you wash us with the purity of the Holy Spirit and you inspire us with his breath. That you help us to glorify the Father in what we paint, in what we create in music, in technology, in acting, in sculpting, in architecture, in poetry. We pray that we may lift the eyes of other souls on earth to heaven, that we may inspire them to union with God. And we beg and we pray for a greater fruitfulness in what we have created for you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thank you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.